Trackless Morning, The Mobilities of Love and Loss. The country music song, The Long Black Veil, first recorded by Johnny Cash in 1965, tells the story of a woman who continues to, quote, walk the cold dark hills where her lover is buried 10 years after his death. In a long black veil, she assumes the otherworldliness of a ghost. And indeed, the, ly the lyrics take the form of a du double ghost story in as much as it's narrated by her dead lover, hung for a murder he did not commit. This miscarriage of justice was the result of his refusal to provide the alibi that would have spared his life, namely that he spent the night with the woman in question, who also happened to be the wife of his best friend. As well as being an irresistible love story combining mystery, passion and sacrifice, The Long Black Veil captures the way in which the bereaved as well as the deceased can haunt a landscape through their recursive wanderings. Indeed, most of us have been or have the potential to become the woman in The Long Black Veil at some point in our lives, with our acts of mourning remaining every bit as elusive and trackless as hers. The significance of mobility to the practice of grief, mourning and remembrance has been commented on, upon by geographer Avril Madrell, uh, whose recent work on grief maps and the ways in which reiterative performance is an integral part of everyday memorialization. And this has made a major uh, contribution to our understanding of the spatiality of bereavement. In general, however, mobility scholarship has yet to explore the formative significance of mobility upon our intimate relationships to any great extent. And it's my hope that humanities-based approaches, such as my own, will contribute new layers of psychological complexity to these debates. With respect to the, the material under discussion here, I'm proposing that it's sometimes strategic to take together the memorial practices associated with death and those pursued in everyday life, on account of their often surprising continuities. Following both Tim Ingold's work on lines and Omri Bergson's on memory, it may be mooted that the tracks, both literal and figurative, that we lay down during the life of a relationship are often the same ones we use to honour it in after years. My recent research has indeed discovered strong similarities in spatialities and mobilities associated with courtship and those practised in bereavement, and a comparative mapping can produce fascinating insights into the way in which individuals, couples and families experience and perform their love for one another across the life course. The activities and events that characterise the early years of a relationship, whether this be public, walking out, car driving, spontaneous way wayfaring or secret assignations, become part of the embodied memory bank of the partners concerned. The question which follows is in two parts and explores first some of the different ways in which we can theorise the connection between the mobilities we pursue in the course of a relationship and those we use to memorialise it. This takes the form of a section of autoethnography and reflection, followed by a brief overview of how my proposition builds upon recent publications on mobility, mourning and the landscape. This is followed by another subsection on memory and nostalgia, which draws upon Henri Bergson's work on the embodied processes which create, store and actualize memories to further make the, the case for there being a link between the mobilities of love and the mobilities of loss. The second part of the article then explores the contrast between public and spectacular and private and often invisible mourning uh, with reference to a selection of literary text and proposes that the practice of remembrance may, with respect to the latter, be reduced to pure reiterative movement. However, while such transient gestures of remembrance may be contrasted with the many and various place-specific memorials investigated by geographers working in this field, um, I conclude the article by interrogating the fine line that distinguishes place marking from place making and inquire whether, whether any act of mourning, uh, which involves an element of repetition, can be truly trackless. So moving now on to the section theorising the mobilities of love and loss, beginning with uh, a section of autoethnography. So uh, this section of autoethnography is called Automobility and Autoethnography Following the Hearse. <laughs> 
On the 6th of September 2003, I found myself making one of the more unusual car journeys of my life. My father was in the late stages of terminal cancer and after a long afternoon and night in which he was physically stuck in his chair, unable to move, I was finally allowed to call the doctor. After some ringing around, the doctor eventually found him a bed in a local hospice and a few hours later, an ambulance was transporting him down the A30 road to Hale. Uh, this is in Cornwall, um, with me following behind in my car. This was the last journey he was to make while still alive. Even at the time, the symbolism of, of all this did not escape me. Trained as a mechanic in the years immediately following World War II, my father's life had been in many ways defined by automobility. Now he was making his final living journey in a vehicle not dissimilar to the scammel he drove during the Korean War, while I followed respectfully behind in the old VW he once bought for me. Two days later, I found myself making an even more extraordinary journey along the same stretch of road, but in the opposite direction. By now, my father was dead, having passed away peacefully within 28 hours of arriving in Hale. It was Monday morning, and I'd returned to the hospice to collect his belongings and to register the death, uh, which entailed a further journey to Penzance. It was therefore some hours later before I made my way back up the road again, and just before a druth, I found myself following a hearse. As it turned off at Scoria Crossroads, it dawned upon me that the hearse contained my father, who was now on his way to the funeral, funeral director's chapel of rest. In the space of just two days then, I had accompanied my father by car on his final earthly journeys, the first still living, the second newly dead and grasp something of the way in which the end of life is characterised not by rest and stasis, but rather an interval of intense mobility. Although the circumstances and coincidences which disclosed uh, to me the signal role automobility plays in the last days of a person's life were of course unique, their implication could be applied more widely. As Roger Marja Hava, has noted with specific reference to Sweden, in purely spatial terms, the geographical remit of a 21st century funeral is vast with mourners located far afield um, and or abroad. Translated into mileage, the figures are even more thought provoking, especially when one considers with respect to the deceased that a good deal of this movement is unnecessary. Although in my father's case, transport transportation to the hospice was clearly urgent and essential, his return journey two days, two days later arguably was not. The deceased person could be taken for cremation or burial straight from the hospital morgue, but an interim laying out at the undertaker's funeral parlour remains the preference of most families in Britain today. In a tradition that is seen to date back to ambro ambrosial uh, Christian rituals uh, from the 8th and 9th centuries AD, the journey from the hospital to the undertakers is often but the first leg of a long stage journey for the corpse. From hospital to chapel of rest, from chapel of rest to the family home, from the family home to church or chapel, from the church or chapel to the cemetery, as well as the shorter journeys the coffin makes as it's carried to and from the hearse. Placed in the specific historical and geograph geographical context of the British Isles, the protracted and often circular motorised journeys undertaken by the deceased today also replicate the ways in which bodies were transported along old corpse roads in past centuries, um, often quite closely. In the district of Morven in the Western Highlands, for example, the hearse still stops at a local landmark stone in order for the mourners to build a small cairn in memory of their loved ones. This stone is itself a huge slab used as a rest for the coffins and indeed for the bearers themselves on their long and often arduous journey back to the kirk. While the cairns remain unmarked, it being considered bad luck to name the loved ones who've been lost. So this practice serves as a reminder that um, in some natures, nations and cultures at least, hypermobility has for centuries been integral to the funeral ceremony. <laughs>
Meanwhile, and to conclude this section, these reflections on my father's death also revealed to me the way in which the journeys we make to mark the end of life often do shadow those made years earlier in the most telling of ways. As a child, I traveled along that stretch of road, the A30 in Cornwall with my father on many occasions and being able to do so again in death, albeit by chance, became an important part of the grieving process for me. My drive home behind the hearse is also indicative of the way in which the public journeys occasioned by death often mask or run alongside very private and subjective ones. So moving on now to some of the uh, theoretical uh, contacts for this discussion, um, the section memorialization, memory and nostalgia. So one of the ways of understanding the connection between the memorial practices associated specifically with the death of those practiced in life is via the concept of nostalgia, especially when placed alongside Henri Bergson's model of memory as perception. Indeed, in this section, I would like to propose that there are similarities between the way in which we create and store memories, uh, the way we project and protect them, the mechanism of nostalgia, and the way we reactivate them in later years, that is the process of memorialization. This will, I hope, resonate with recent work in social and cultural geography where memory, especially in relation to landscape, has become a central concern. Even as nostalgia is defined etymologically as a longing to return home, so it has come to exist in the popular imagination as a dreamlike journey backwards in time. From a geographer's point of view, it's precisely the fact that this journeying in time is also a journeying in and through space that ren renders it such a resonant phenomenon. The two dimensions being locked together in the manner of uh, Mikhail Bakhtin's chronotope. Reflecting on the story most often told to explain the origins of the disease nostalgia, specifically Dr. Johann Hoffer's quote, discovery of a curious psychosomatic illness present amongst Swiss soldiers uh, fighting during the 17th century. What leaps out is the fact that the exiles longing to travel back in time, that is to their former lives, was facilitated by the very material possibility of their doing so in and through space. In other words, they know that across the miles, their homes are still there waiting for them. As I've discussed elsewhere in relation to daydreaming and driving, some modicum of credibility is necessary to make all such fantasies uh, that project images from the past onto the future meaningful and credible. And here it's uh, the credibility, and here the credibility is provided by the fact that these soldiers could, if they wished, travel home. While um, most theorists who have written about nostalgia have continued to treat it as an historical disease of the zeitgeist, um, although one that's now more commonly associated with late modernity, a few commentators, including Raymond Williams and Frederick Raphael, have been prepared to hazard that nostalgia is a trans-historical human condition. If we focus on its Bactinian temporal spatial properties as outlined above, then perhaps this, the case can be made for this. Although with the proviso that uh, rather than an extraordinary or impossible fantasy, nostalgia is arguably better understood as a realizable everyday practice. So probably the best way to illustrate my thinking here is by way of personal anecdote. So uh, since moving to my village in Scotland 22 years ago, I've built up a portfolio of local walks that I make on a regular basis. Each one of them is inscribed by multiple memories of things that have happened in my life during those years. And there are a great many features in the landscape, trees, boulders, gateways, old buildings, the annual flowering of certain plants and flowers that have particular connotations and conjure up particular moments in time. My local habitual and in every way unremarkable walk through a familiar landscape is thus the occasion of what for some would constitute nostalgia, though it bears none of the obvious hallmarks of either insatiable longing that uh, Svetlana Boim associates with what she calls reflective nostalgia, 
or indeed the complete reconstruction of the past associated with restorative nostalgia. Indeed, the spirit in which such encounters uh, uh, are undertaken has much more in common, I think, with the memorialist desire to explore and honour the past. For even as uh, our visits to graves and other official and unofficial memorials may be seen to reproduce the recursive mobilities of childhood and courtship, so do our most banal rambles reunite us with people and events that have been important to us through a complex and ongoing process of projection and introjection. Placed in this longitudinal context, memorialization thus becomes a practice that has as much to do with fixing or at least slowing down the ephemerality of everyday life as it is about mitigating the finite, finite loss of significant others. And while such practices are possibly in line uh, with the characteristics of nostalgia as sentimental or unhealthy, um, uh, they may also be considered part and parcel of the very workings of memory itself. While Henri Bergson's theory of memory, um, as developed across his oeuvre, is far more complex than the vision contained in his short essay on déjà vu, I have nevertheless found that source to be especially evocative for understanding the signal role both embodiment and mobility play in the actualization of memory, and indeed the intrinsically mobile nature of memory itself. Particularly suggestive for the argument I've been pursuing here is his, his account of the way in which our perceptions in the present are reactivated as memories as and when we have particular need for them. For Bergson, this process is demonstrated most vividly in the phenomenon of déjà vu or false recognition, wherein we fleetingly glimpse those perceptions which have only just lodged themselves in our unconscious. And I've got a key quote here. So, step by step, as perception is created, it is profiled in memory, which is beside it like a shadow is next to a body. But in the normal conditions, there is no consciousness of it, just as we should be unconscious of our shadow were our eyes to shed light on it each time it turned in that direction. According to Bergson then, the uncanny sense of having been somewhere before or knowing what we are about to say next depends upon the fact that we have indeed already thought these things, but only a few seconds previously. The implication of this modelling of memory for a better understanding of the everyday processes of memorialization as outlined above are, are I would suggest, considerable. First, the way that Bergson conceives of the relationship between perception and memory points to the availability of a potentially vast repository of phenomena, practices and events that may be activated at any, at any moment. Secondly, his insistence that perceptions are actualized by memories by dint of necessity rather than the mere prompt of association helps explain why embodied movement plays such a crucial role in the stimulation of memory. As I've discussed elsewhere in relationship to car driving, the decisions we make while spatially manoeuvring ourselves about the world often calls for this sort of assistance. We draw upon former perceptions to identify what or where something is located spatially and or what to do next. Indeed, the urgency and relevance of such a memory appears to be directly related to its vividness. As when, for example, we lose our way in a place we have visited only once before, but then recover our sense of direction by accessing our previous experience of being there. So significant is such a moment of recall, meanwhile, that we are unlikely to mistake our way around that place um, in the future. The original perception accessed as a memory is now, as it were, memorialized. And if by analogy, we replace root finding with a rather more emotional set of circumstances, for example, a walk to where we come across a bridge we recognize, but with the sense of something missing, a person, for instance, it's not hard to see why certain memory acts can easily become memorial acts. <laughs> 
once excavated from Bergson's repository of pure or virtual memory to perform this sort of task, the memory is likely to be seared upon our consciousness um, in perpetuity. Further, while this sort of embodied recall does not necessarily depend upon mobility per se, as geographers and or mobility scholars, we cannot fail to be interested in the fact that it often does. As I've explored elsewhere, Bergson's description of the way in which perception and memory are laid down next to one another in consciousness is strikingly reminiscent of Tim Ingold's geospatial characterization of the way in which we both make and follow pathways in the landscape, with our present footfall unconsciously, indeed uncannily, remembering where we trod before. For both these thinkers, mind and body have the capacity to slip seamlessly into the present from the past, thus explaining how certain expressions of movement in the present, from the smallest bodily gesture to a drive along a once familiar road, can be so evocative. This dynamic has also been explored by, by Owen Jones with reference to his old childhood haunts, and of course resonates with Avril Madril's work on how the bereaved ensure continuing bonds with their loved ones through a creative variety of customized and memorial practices in the material landscape. Further, as I now proceed to demonstrate by means of textual examples, the mobilities of love, loss and memorialization can be expressed in both the most public and spectacular and the most private and invisible of ways. So moving on now to the section of the paper where um, I explore some of these ideas via some textual examples. So this section is called From Public Highway to Traceless Track. The Christian humanist tradition within Western culture has ensured that funer funeral ceremonies feature prominently in the history of its literature. And I now, I now turn to two very different, differently situated texts, Dorothy Words Word Word Wordsworth's Lakeland Journals from the early 19th century and William Faulkner's novel, As I Lay Dying, written during the American Depression of the 1930s, uh, to reflect further on the mobility and memorial practices involved. In particular, I focus on the elaborate, protracted and arguably excessive nature of the mobilities deployed in the conveyancing of the body, as well as the identifying moments where private and invisible micro mobilities are unfolded into the public ceremony. In her diary for the 3rd of September 1800, Dorothy Wordsworth records her attendance at the funeral of a local woman, seemingly a pauper, without family, while her brothers William and John, along with Coleridge, climb Helvellyn. Aside from the gendered politics of this, uh, Dorothy Wordsworth's account provides a fascinating insight into how, in a rural par parish at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries, the staged mobilities discussed in the previous section are carried out to the letter. And I've got here a quote from her, her journals. So she writes, they set the corpse down at the door and while we stood within the threshold, the men with their hats off sang with decent and solemn countenances a verse of, of a, a funeral psalm. The corpse was then borne down the hill and they sang till they passed the town end. I was affected to tears while we stood in the house, the coffin lying before me. Although the distance the, the woman's coffin is borne is not huge by corpse road standards, from town end to the church itself is over half a mile, and the woman's residence a further distance from town end. Even before embarking upon this journey to the church, however, we note that the corpse is carried within the house to the threshold where psalms are read, the moment of rest marking the first of several intervals which serve to both lengthen the process and make the movement that follows more pronounced and significant. The conveyancing of the body to the church is moreover divided into geographically defined phases through the singing of the mourners, uh, which they continue uh, right through to their arrival at town end and begin again as soon as they come to the bridge a few hundred yards before the church. The deceased woman's last journey on earth is thus skillfully extended both te temporally and spatially, and the mourner's respect seems encoded in the time that they're prepared to afford her. In the absence of anything else, it seems, this last long journey serves as the community's final gift to the woman. Evidently moved 
by her uh, intellectual observations on the darkness of the house and church in contrast to the brightness of the, the sun sunlit landscape. Dorothy Wordsworth was, I would suggest, also affected by her embodied participation in a walking event that echoes so many others she pursued with her brother, brother William on a regular basis and then memorialized in her diaries. Public, ceremonial and dignified as, this, as the funeral ceremony is, Dorothy Wordsworth's complex mixed emotions, wonder as well as sadness, owe their resonance to her everyday practice as a diarist intent on capturing and making permanent the ephemeral nature of the life world. Meanwhile, the journey undertaken by Adi Burden's corpse in Faulkner's novel follows a remarkably similar route to that of the unnamed woman featured in Dorothy Wordsworth's diaries, but in circumstances so protracted, hyperbolic and grotesque that this is not immediately obvious. This radical defamiliarization of what, after all, is one of life's most everyday and unavoidable social practices was presumably the author's intentions. Stretching the material as well as the psychological aspects of a typical artisan funeral to the uttermost limits of possibility in the manner of the darkest of comedies. In contrast to the mile or two that the pauper in Dorothy Wordsworth's text is born to her final resting place, Adi Burden and her cortege embark upon a journey of over 60 miles from the home in the backwoods of Mississippi to the town of Jefferson, all by mule cart. This, this journey, not impossible in and of itself, um, becomes Herculean when continuous rain necessitates an impossible river crossing in which the first set of mules are drowned and various other accidents and delays mean that Adi Burden's rapidly decomposing body has symbolically run out of time when the cortege finally makes it to, to the outskirts of the city. Fascinating on any number of levels, from a mobility's perspective, it's hard not to read this macabre and hyperbolic funeral procession as a comment on the excess inherent in the Christian ceremony, and in particular, the rituals surrounding the conveyancing of the corpse back to the place of the person's birth. By exaggerating every stage of the journey as he does, Faulkner holds a magnifying lens to his protagonist's compulsive, superstitious, and above all, excessive memorial practices, and in the process asks us to consider why they are necessary. In my discussion of Dorothy Wordsworth's text, I provi provided one possible answer to this question. Um, arguably, the mile long walk to the church gives the mourners the time they need uh, for their sentiments to be both stirred and relieved. And their embodied mobile and communal participation in the event offers a very material expression of empathy, empathy with, the, with the bereaved. However, for Faulkner, as for many other fiction writers, the public enactment of mourning is never that simple. And Faulkner's text portrays the ceremony as one that serves the complex psychological needs of the various characters rather than those of Adi Burden herself. Elsewhere, uh, literature provides us with instances of private mourning rather more akin to the sorts of memorial practices featured in Avril Madril's case studies. And the concept of trackless mourning that I introduced at the start of the article via the figure of the woman in the Johnny Cash song. Thomas Hardy's The Woodlanders is an is an especially poignant example in this regard if we focus on the character of Marty South, a woman set to mourn the death of a fellow labourer, Giles Winterbourne, for the rest of her life through actions that symbolically unite the two while remaining invisible to the rest of the world. The denouement of the story, which centres on Winterbourne's sacrifice, he offers Grace Fitzpiers, a woman with whom he's long been in love, the shelter of his hut when she's cast out of his father's, her father's house on account of her husband's infidelity. In order to avoid compromising her reputation still further, Winterbourne refuses to share the hut with her and during a cold spell catches pneumonia and dies. In the weeks and months immediately following the tragedy, Grace, a middle-class doctor's wife, and Marty, a woodlander like Giles, come together in their mourning of Giles. Quote, the church stood somewhat outside the village and could be reached without passing through the street. In the dusk of the late September day, they went thither by secret ways 
walking mostly in silence side by side, each busy, busied with her own thoughts. They stood at the grave together, and though the sun had gone down, they could get glimpses of the woodland for miles. In terms of the mobility practices discussed in this article, this scenario is both familiar and unusual. Familiar in as much as the deep mourning for the loved, lo, sorry, for the lost loved one is in part a private and invisible act, but unusual in as much as the two women are sharing the grieving and the memorialization. Once again, the distance from the churchyard to the village facilitates the ceremony as and of course replicates the route taken by the funeral procession itself. Following Grace's reconciliation with her erring husband, however, Marty is left to continue her weekly ritual on her own. The novel marks this occasion when Grace first forgets to turn up by referring to Grace as Marty's fellow pilgrim, and in so doing foregrounds the crucial role that walking has played in the expression of their mourning. Our final image of Marty, however, connects her with Giles through the everyday mobility practices they share together as skilled woodlanders. And I would suggest demonstrates most evocatively Bergson's theory of uh, the way in which memory is activated by practical necessity. Marty will remember Giles every time she reenacts a skill that he was expert in and in the process finds solace in fusing with or becoming the person she has loved and lost a perfect example of how mobility is integral to both memory and mourning in its everyday non-representationality and invisible to others. So moving on now to the conclusion. This article has sought to contribute to debates in cultural geography on the practice of mourning and remembrance, both through prioritizing the role of mobility and proposing that there is a connection between the ways we mark and memorialize events during the life of an intimate relationship and those we pursue when the person concerned is lost to us. This proposition is made in the context of my wider research on the role of mobilities in the production and sustenance of relationships throughout the life course and relates in particular to the significance of mobilities within courtship. Although this might present itself as a strange yoking, I've attempted to demonstrate the way in which the mobilities that come to characterize a relationship remain part of its DNA in perpetuity. In other words, and following Tim Ingold, the lines or tracks we laid down during the different phases of life remain with us. And while such recursive wandering may well have specific geographical expression, my focus on the mobility event has helped further explain why so much private mourning remains notionally invisible and trackless. In theoretical terms, the reasoning that underpins this bid to link the mobilities of love with those of loss depends upon a model of memory that is itself inscribed by mobility and embodiment. Bergson's work on the way in which perception and memory shadow one another in his essay on déjà vu is crucial in this regard arguing as it does for perceptions to be reconstituted as memories as and when needed, often in response to a kinetic prompt. This helps explain, to, helps explain why acts of mourning are inspired not only by visiting a place with powerful associations, but also through embodied movements, ranging from physical activities and or modes of transportation through to the smallest bodily gesture. Nostalgia too may be seen to be dependent upon mobility. If we observe the extent to which the desired transportation back in time is crucially dependent upon the material possibility of returning to a particular location in and through space. As I argue here, it is the latter that renders the fantasy of the former both credible and compelling. In the same way then that Bergson's theory of memory helps uh, us better understand how everyday memories are created and stored, so does a mobilized concept of nostalgia illuminate how we explore and store our most precious experiences. Taken together, moreover, they show how the practice of memorialization often begins long before the material loss of a loved one occurs. Meanwhile, um, a second strand of my argument is explored both the difference and similarities between the macro mobilities of death, notably funerals, and our personal or trackless mourning processes. 
With reference to a small selection of text, I've used mobility theory to posit some theories of why funerals in the Christian tradition should continue to be so excessive of distance and so protracted of time. The shared embodiment of the mourners and the deceased presents itself as a compelling explanation here, though both Wordsworth's journals and Faulkner's novel also question the extent to which such, such ceremonies themselves constitute a meaningful uh, example of memory work. So I think they, they both question maybe the integrity um, of such practices. This is why Marty South's manner of honouring Giles Winterbourne um, in Hardy's novel speaks volumes. Not only are her actions invisible and trackless, but they are also born of perceptions and skills laid down years before. Leaving no obvious trace whatsoever on the landscape, Marty's acts of mourning are translated into pure movement. And uh, here's the, the really memorable quotation in this respect. Hardy writes uh, in, in the voice of Marty, whenever I plant the young larches, I'll think that none can plant as you planted. And whenever I split a gad, and whenever I turn the cider ring, I'll say none could do it like you. If ever I forget your name, let me forget home and heaven. Um, this said, um, and with reference back to my previous discussion, the notion that any repetitive act of mourning is wholly without trace in terms of the landscape in which it's practiced is debatable. True, our tracks may imprint themselves upon the landscape in ways that are invisible to the naked eye, but following Ingold, they nevertheless constitute a reductive line of sorts and over time have the same potential to transfigure the landscape um, as do more material and static monuments. Therefore, while going back to the, the quote from the Johnny Cash song, therefore, while nobody knows and nobody sees the nightly wanderings of the woman in the long black veil, we must conclude that the landscape would have felt the pressure of her tread, however ghostly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's the end of my talk and just a few contact details there. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.